Welcome everyone to this virtual ocean dialogue on ocean-based climate solutions. My name is Elizabeth Cousins and I'm the President and CEO of the United Nations Foundation and I'm honored and delighted to be with you today to moderate what I know will be a very inspiring and thought-provoking discussion. The UN Foundation mission is to work with the UN and its partners to help build a better world. We focus on issues at the heart of the sustainable development goals, build initiatives across sectors to solve problems at scale, and engage influencers, citizens, and stakeholders who are committed to action on these critical issues we all face. Over the past few years, we've especially been working at the intersection of ocean and climate issues, and it is so exciting to be here with so many kindred spirits. Well, as was the case last year, the ocean community finds itself in 2021, again with a gap in the political calendar, with the UN Ocean Conference now rescheduled to 2022. The Friends of Ocean Action and the World Economic Forum are helping fill this gap by hosting virtual ocean dialogues as a moment for the global community to come together to keep the ocean high on the agenda and continue to build momentum around critical ocean issues. So this year, the virtual ocean dialogues are focused on the importance of the ocean to critical multilateral milestones ahead, including the UN Food Systems Summit, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the G7, the G20, as well as, of course, COP26. The ocean is critical to the solutions we need in all of these areas, and these dialogues are designed to help identify where stakeholders from around the world can help make the ocean a prominent part of all of these efforts. In this session, we're focusing on the UN Climate Change Conference, COP26, as we all know, taking place in Glasgow later this year. We know that the ocean and climate are inextricably linked. The ocean plays a critical role in climate regulation, absorbing up to 90% of excess heat caused by human activity and up to 30% of human carbon dioxide emissions. It's also being negatively impacted by climate change, among so many other pressures, causing rising sea levels, temperature increases, acidification, and deoxygenation. But of course, the ocean is also the source of solutions to the climate crisis. Sustainable ocean-based climate solutions from scaling up offshore renewable energy to creating climate-smart marine protected areas can all help reduce greenhouse gas emissions and build greater resilience for people and planet. Fortunately, ocean-based climate solutions are also being recognized like never before. COP25 was the first blue COP under the leadership of Chile. And last month, ocean-based climate solutions featured prominently in President Biden's Leaders' Summit on Climate in the United States, including at an event that we were, uh, we were lucky to be able to help support as the UN Foundation. So as we look towards COP26, we have a real opportunity to maintain and grow further momentum on climate and ocean action, and we have critical milestone opportunities ahead of us. It's up to us to bring ambition to that task, and I know that all of our guests today will help inspire that. And we have an extremely full agenda. We're going to start with what we're calling a seaside chat between Lord Goldsmith, Minister for Pacific and the Environment uh, of the United Kingdom, and host, of course, of the upcoming COP26 Summit in Glasgow this year, and Mr. Oves Sarmad, Deputy Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. We'll then hear from Gonzalo Munoz, high-level climate champion for Chile, uh, of course, host of the Blue COP, uh, COP25, who will speak to a new ocean climate-focused transformation that is very part of the Champions Race to Zero initiative. And then we'll move into a panel featuring a rock star of, 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 of experts, including Sherry Nursalim, Special Advisor on Climate Change to the Government of the Republic of Indonesia and the Vice Chairman of Giti Group, David Abura, founder of the Coastal Oceans Research and Development in the Indian Ocean, Cordio, in East Africa. Angelique Pupono, Chief Executive Officer at the Seychelles Conservation and Climate Adaptation Trust. And Valdemar Kutz, Director of Environment and Oceans of Chile's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So let's dive in. Um, first, we're honored uh, in our seaside chat to be joined by Deputy Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC, Mr. Oves Sarmad, and Lord Goldsmith of the United Kingdom. Uh, our COP26 hosts, of course. Uh, Lord Goldsmith is a vocal champion for nature conservation in the UK and beyond. He was first appointed to his current roles in February of last year with ministerial responsibilities that span everything from forestry and biodiversity to the illegal wildlife trade. As the United Kingdom gears up for what I gather is the largest political gathering it has ever held, we'll see if that's true. Uh, we're delighted he's able to join us today. Oves Sarmad has been Deputy Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC for three years. 
previously serving as Chief of Staff to the Director General at the International Organization for Migration, following over 20 years in that organization. In his role at the UNFCCC, he helps manage the operations of the entire organization, advises on a full range of strategic and international issues, and describes himself in his Twitter biography as a congenital stubborn optimist. So we're delighted that you're also able to join us and hopeful that you will import a strong dose of that to all of us this afternoon. So a warm welcome uh, to you. Um, and I'm going to start, um, Obes, uh, with you. Um, Lord Goldsmith has described COP26 as a once in a generation opportunity to protect our planet from the impacts of climate change and to restore the natural world that sustains us in all, in all ways. It's clear that the challenges facing us from the twin crises of climate and biodiversity loss are immense. And since the Paris Agreement, we have seen growing awareness of how the ocean can contribute to the stable functioning of our planet and climate, but the urgency of the challenge has also grown. So it's clear that COP26 is absolutely pivotal as a point on our calendar. What do you see as the most critical steps we need to take to accelerate that journey to net zero, and how can the ocean play its part? Elizabeth, thank you very much, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to join this group and uh, at the outset, uh, also like to thank uh, the organizers, the World Economic Forum, WRI, and uh, the Friends of Ocean Action. Uh, and I can say that uh, this, is a, this is a very meaningful group, and I, I personally and professionally support their work deeply. A brief context, uh, reflection, reflecting what Lord Goldsmith has said, that this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity, COP26, and why is that? From our perspective, it, it's very clear, uh, especially coming out of a uh, bit of a dip in global international commitment to climate action in the last few years because of political upheavals that we all faced. Uh, we're coming out of it and also the backdrop of COVID, recovery from the COVID. This COP indeed is a once in a generation opportunity. And why is that? Because where we want to rebuild the trust in multilateralism and and uh, engage everybody, all sectors, uh, government, public sector, private sector, individuals, to raise ambition, to uh, really turn the corner and, uh, as we also call it, you know, uh, to turn the corner and get to the tipping point of a positive uh, climate action. And in doing so, we need to also uh, keep the promises that were made. That is, the governments need to keep the promises that were made five years ago when the Paris Agreement was adopted. And one of the main, uh, the uh, the key promise was the developed countries promised that they would provide hundred billion dollars every year from 2020 onwards to developing countries to adapt to the impacts of climate change, including to uh, protect the oceans. So that needs to be done because that has, that has become a major issue in the rebuilding of the trust and confidence in taking the uh, actions that I just mentioned. And then finally, also to finish the rule book, as we call it, that is to make the Paris Agreement fully operational. We did a lot of work in Katowice and Madrid, but there are a few elements of that Paris Agreement implementation that still remain to be completed. So COP26 is the year, is the time to do that. So uh, that is uh, the backdrop. Now, where do the oceans come into all of this? Is Oceans uh, cover 71% of the Earth mass. Uh, so th th it's very obvious that we need to make sure that we protect that mass of our uh, existential asset, if you like. And in doing so, um, if, we, if we don't do that, uh, we continue to uh, uh, see the warming uh, of the oceans and acidification, deoxygenation, uh, sea level rise, and all of that will result in huge displacement and suffering all around us. And we are seeing that. As we speak right now, there is a cyclone that has just hit, hit the eastern part of India uh, twice in a week. So these events are happening all, all around so there is a huge opportunity. So oceans provide a huge space also for mitigation action through offshore renewables, restoration, and protection of blue carbon, 
low carbon has become a major source of sinks. And that is recognized in our process uh, of UNFCCC. So that is extremely important. And all of that would reduce emissions uh, also from the ocean space transport. So there are many mitigation aspects. We, we also need to build ocean-based res uh, ocean resilience through uh, nature-based solutions and, uh, and many other actions that we need to take. Otherwise, uh, things will just become even more difficult. And Paris Agreement provides a fantastic opportunity and a format and a framework in which countries are required to submit the NDCs and National Adaptation Plans in which the way they deal with oceans, oceans as a um, source of mitigating and protecting the biodiversity is a recognized and a very significant part of their commitments. So we would like to see that uh, happen. And we are seeing some very good results. I'm sure Gonzalo will talk about it. Chile has led uh, that by uh, showing that by example. Uh, Chile, which has a huge coastline, and they know what it means to live with and protect the ocean. So, so those are uh, some of the things that I wanted to share with you, and uh, we can then have a, a discussion. I just don't want to be talking myself. I'd like to hear others and engage in a conversation. Back to you, Elizabeth. Well, wonderful. Thank you. And I'm very pleased now to turn to uh, Lord Goldsmith, who has joined us. I'm so sorry. Um, no, it's wonderful to see you. Um, Lord Goldsmith, we already introduced you, um, so thrilled to have you here for our seaside chat. Um, I wonder if you could say a bit about um, the UK's priorities for COP26 as the host um, and to kind of help set the scene for our conversation in this session. Tell us a bit about why the UK government has prioritized the ocean is so important to the climate agenda and especially how you see the role of nature um, playing out in, in the priorities for a successful COP. Okay, th thank you so much. And I really apologize for being late. It might be techno technological wizardry failed me. Um, but, I, sorry, but I'm here and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, look, we, the ocean matters because it matters for climate. The ocean helps regulate our climate. We, we think it's absorbed around 90% of the excess heat that hum human activities have caused. Um, we think it's absorbed around nearly a third of human CO2 emissions or human caused uh, CO2 emissions. It provides oxygen in every second breath that we take billions of people rely on the ocean for their food around a billion people depend on fish as their main source of protein um, and hundreds of millions depend on oceans for their livelihoods um, estimated around three billion so it, it matters and at the same time as its importance is really not in doubt we're decimating it almost two-thirds of our coastal wetlands are are now degraded. About a third of marine mammals are threatened with extinction. We believe around a third of all fisheries have either gone or on the brink. And just as quickly as we're stripping life out of the ocean, we're filling it with trash. And there's only so long the ocean can, can act as a buffer and take the beating, the savaging that, 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 is, that is happening, that we're subjecting it to. Um, and, and we know there's a knock-on effect. So as the ocean warms, even if we stick to two degrees, we are expecting to lose around 99% of corals. Corals provide habitat for a quarter of all marine species. So on and on and on it goes. So the ocean really matters. And the most important thing we can do for the ocean, although there are lots of things, but the most important thing we can do is keep within one and a half degrees. That means halving emissions this decade. It means net zero by 2050. If we do that, then we will, do, we will be doing our bit to try and maintain the system, the ocean system, that, that enables everything else that I just described to happen. Once that system begins to break down, it becomes very, very hard for, to do what we need to do. So that is the single most important thing, but there's an awful lot more, stopping the plastic pollution, fishing responsibly, protecting large areas, et cetera. Um, but in the context of climate, it's 1.5 degrees. Well, thank you so much. And you know, the Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean and Friends of Ocean Action co-chair Peter Thompson has said there is no more important restorative moment for the ocean than COP26 and yeah. has called for um, the summit to be seen through the, the blue lens of the ocean. Ocean is climate, climate is ocean, as you've just really powerfully laid out. Recognizing that we do have participants online who may be less familiar with these issues, you've already given us a, a really good sweep, but could you say a little bit more about some of the specific ways the role the ocean can play a role in climate solutions and what you expect to see at COP26. 
Yeah, and 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 I'd love to do that. And your question, actually, right at the beginning, was was almost more broad than than the oceans. It was more about nature generally. And we, it doesn't matter how you look at it, or or which organisation's model or blueprint um, you're studying or following, there is no pathway to net zero or to 1.5 degrees without massively increasing our efforts to protect and restore nature. And that's everything from forests to oceans and mangroves in between. Um, we think that nature-based solutions could provide around a third of the most cost effective solution to climate change and the beauty of nature-based solutions is that they do a lot more than that they support livelihoods they support biodiversity we know that we're in the middle of a biodiversity crisis um, they they help communities be more resilient to what we know is going to be a change in climate no matter how effective we are uh, collectively in tackling climate change so we we despite that huge contribution that nature can provide it only gets about a third, a sub third. It only gets about three percent of total global finance, uh, uh, climate finance, which is totally disproportionate to the impact it could have. And within that three percent, a tiny part of that is for the ocean. So a, a huge opportunity we have, and which we need to seize, is protecting and restoring mangroves. A billion people depend on wetlands for a living. A hundred million people live within ten kilometres of mangroves. And we know the mangroves are critically important breeding grounds for important fish. They can reduce. The the depth of flooding from tsunamis by anything up to 30%, planting them um, is a fantastic way of mitigating climate change, absorbing carbon, but also providing that resilience. Salt marshes too absorb about 90% of the energy of waves and seagrasses are nurseries for about 20% of the world's large fishes and home to uh, endemic and endangered species, everything from the dugong to, uh, to, to turtles to seahorses are, uh, and man manatees are the same as dugongs. Um, they are hugely important so the more we can do to find those opportunities to invest in restoring the ocean systems the more impact we'll have on climate change both mitigation and adaptation so it is a priority and i, I completely agree with those comments that, that from the un secretary general i think that's who you were quoting earlier uh, the un ocean ambassador um, and and the last point i'd make is that you know we can get depressed looking at the figures of destruction when it comes to the natural world and they are stark i mean it's, it's horrific we're losing 30 football pitches worth of forest every minute we're a million species facing extinction plus the figures i mentioned earlier but protecting nature in the marine environment does work we know that and the marine protection is almost like a magic cure you look at any marine protected area in the world that's been set up and you see within a matter of three four five six years the catch for local fishing communities goes up outside of those protected areas because they've become nurseries. So the more protected areas we can create, the better. And quite often they're controversial when they're starting, particularly with fishing communities. But after a few years of being established, they're embraced pretty pretty much everyone. It's a win-win-win. So it was a big part of our program. We've, we've doubled our climate finance. We're going to put nearly a third of it into nature-based solutions, which equates to about three billion pounds into nature. Of that, we're putting a half a billion pounds a fund together called the Blue Planet Fund. And that will be helping communities around the world establish and better protect marine protected areas in the key areas um, and that will in involve things like mangrove planting it'll involve coral reef protection seagrasses but it'll also involve protecting areas of the high seas where um, you know, two-thirds of the ocean are beyond national jurisdiction and need protection as well now, thank you for such a, a rich laying out of all of the different considerations and, and actions that are already being taken and that can be scaled further. Um, uh, Oves, I want to ask you kind of a similar question um, because the um, the subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice of the UNFCCC, that's a lot of words for an important body, recently came out with a report um, highlighting a number of specific ideas and actions also that could be taken. And I wonder if you could just say, um, from your perspective, what do you think are the most important steps that could be taken specifically also at COP26 as we look toward that moment and, and what we're looking for, not just governments, but all stakeholders to try to, to come to the table to deliver? Thank you, Elizabeth, and it's very heartening to hear uh, Lord Goldsmith uh, and his perspective and would like to have another opportunity to uh, dig, some, dig deeper into some of the things that he mentioned. But you're right, uh, in COP26, about a year, no, more than a year ago, actually, because 2020 seemed to have been just wiped out. So 2019 in Spain, uh, COP25 took a decision, and one of the bodies of COP is SUBSTA, which is the scientific body. It took a decision that uh, I called on the governments to strengthen understanding of the action on ocean and climate change 
adaptation and mitigation. So it was a formal decision that was taken, and uh, so and that resulted in an, uh, something referred to as ocean dialogue, which offered a vital space for enhancing and strengthening the learning, the action, and the synergy. And there were there were a lot of synergies that uh, had to be made because in the UN we tend to have a bit of siloed approach. Uh, our organization does something. The uh, CBD does another thing and CCD and all of that. So the idea was to bring all the UN organizations, the NGOs, the businesses, uh, private sector all together and participate and of all uh, representing of all voices at the table to provide a co-produced equitable solution and people-centered action. And uh, that resulted in a report which was then uh, presented uh, which also highlighted the divide between ocean and climate, ocean and biodiversity, ocean and sustainable development. Those were all completely artificial as you, uh, as, as, as the uh, discussion went deeper to look at those issues. So the outcomes of the ocean dialogue highlighted that moving forward, there must be a strengthened action on ocean and climate incorporated into both processes. Under our process, uh, which is the UNFCCC and the UN, uh, the sustainable development goals and other other processes, and as well as the need to, as Lord Goldsmith also mentioned, to strengthen international finance, because a lot of those actions are very good uh, when when we sit down and discuss those. But to get those actions off from the paper and implement those in an actionable way, uh, we definitely need finance, and that goes back to my first point as I mentioned the commitment made by many of the developed countries to provide that finance to developing countries who are also uh, major uh, custodians and bene beneficiaries from the oceans uh, in many different ways. So, so that is what uh, that SUBSTA did and the work still, I would say, is a work in progress. And once again, COP26 will provide a great opportunity to land that work. No, thank you so much. And you know, this is a rich conversation and we're criminally short of time to have it as fully as I know we would like to continue. So I wonder if I can just turn to you each before we conclude our, our chat for, um, for just a last thought that you'd like to leave our listeners with um, as we think about this calendar marching up to a series of, of related summits around issues of uh, natural systems and human systems. And of course, then concluding with COP26. Um, Lord Goldsmith, maybe I can go first to you for your final thoughts. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, it's a huge question, so I'm going to have to be disciplined in my answer, but I, na nature has to be at the heart, not, not just of, the, of COP, but really every country's approach to tackling climate change. Um, for, from our part, we are hosting COP, we are also midway hosting through the G7. We're pushing for the highest possible ambition, and we're also working with partners to try and get the biggest possible ambition at Kunming, working with China. We ambitious targets through an agreement that we're going to protect 30 percent of the world's land and ocean by the end of the decade we want new international mechanisms to protect the two-thirds of the ocean beyond national jurisdiction it's a complicated process but countries need to engage in good faith and countries that are engaging in good faith need to team up and put pressure on those that perhaps less so and we need conclusion of the ongoing wto negotiations on fisheries subsidies which are you know, public money being used to cause rather than solve the problem and maybe not finally but i think the climate vulnerable countries many of them are small island developing states have an incredibly powerful voice uh, if they're given the platform you know they're on the front line of dealing with climate change their dependence on the ocean is more acute than most other countries they're not contributors particularly to the problem despite bearing the brunt of the of the of the of the downside um, and many of them are leaders in terms of positioning themselves to address these these issues so i feel the uk has a real responsibility to provide that platform where we can amplify their voices now and in the run-up to the cop and actually listen to, to their voices not just in a box sticking sense but genuinely listen to them um, and so th there's, there's really a huge amount to do and i just make one final point that I'm, 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 I'm so happy today to be able to say that the uk is now moving to full membership of the Ocean Risk and Resilient Action Alliance, or the ORRAA. Um, the, the G7 have just agreed to strengthen support for that initiative, and it's going to build
build resilience in regions most at risk with, I think it's starting with $500 million of investment for uh, inter-nature-based solutions, things, many of the things we've already been talking about. So that's an initiative that we're excited to be part of, and we need to grow and grow and grow that ambition. Well, that's fantastic news. It's a wonderful alliance and initiative, and uh, and that's great news. <laughs> so thank you for, for those thoughts. And Oves, you will have the final word for our Seaside Chat. Well, uh, as you said, uh, there's a lot there, and uh, I, I, can, I can be very brief. I think what we're looking for is a very strong and highest level of political will to turn all of those well-meaning uh, recommendations and uh, actions that have been already uh, clearly laid out uh, into implementation and that involves also the full implementation of Paris Agreement and and unleashing its full potential. So that's where we uh, want to go and once again COP26 is a fantastic and unique opportunity. Well, thank you again both for a wonderful exchange that sets up the rest of our session also so nicely. Um, you can count, I think, on all of us uh, for uh, a thousand percent support um, for this critical moment on the thank calendar. You. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I'd, I'd now like to introduce Gonzalo Munoz, uh, the high-level climate champion uh, for Chile. Uh, together with the UK's high-level climate champion, Nigel Topping, Gonzalo works to champion the ambition and action of non-state actors in addressing climate change. So that means that he works with partners from all sectors, with cities, with states and regions, businesses, investors, civil society groups, labor, to raise the ambition and to create what he has called an ambition loop, where non-state actors push governments to bolder and more ambitious uh, climate action on their part, and where greater government action creates space and support for non-state actors to go even further and faster. Well, as I think many of us know, one of the key initiatives of the high-level champions is the Race to Zero campaign, which aims to mobilize companies to commit to net zero by 2050 with intermediate targets by 2030. Um, and as part of that effort, um, looking at Race to Zero breakthroughs, which are setting specific trajectories for key sectors, including hard to abate sectors and systems. Um, it was launched by uh, the high level climate champions, by um, COP26 president designate Alok Sharma and by the UNFCCC executive secretary Patricia Espinoza. Um, and they really give us a map of what key actors must do by when to deliver on the change that we know we all need. So Gonzalo, we're absolutely delighted to have you join us um, to speak to this topic today about the ocean's crucial contribution to uh, to this important work. So Gonzalo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, dear Lord Gosmid, Oveis, my dear friend, panelists. Uh, it's it's a real pleasure to join you today as, as we're launching a new set of guidance and targets for the ocean to deliver on a resilient net zero future. Uh, as uh, Elizabeth just mentioned, with my dear friend Nigel Topping and, and myself as the two UN high-level champions for climate action, we're building on the legacy of our predecessors to engage with all non-state actors and encourage a collaborative shift across all of society towards the need of the uh, decarbonized economy so that we can all thrive in a healthy, resilient, zero-carbon world. So we're both totally convinced that in that sense, OCEAN has an absolutely critical role to play for the world to deliver on these objectives. So today we're releasing a revised version of the UNFCCC Climate Action Pathways for Oceans and Coastal Zones. This corner store document for ocean climate action provides all stakeholders with a vision for the ocean to deliver on a 1.5 resilient world in 2050 and highlight overarching transformational milestones that need to be achieved. I personally invite all of you to please study this document, hopefully, and please endorse it, and take, of course, the necessary actions to turn this vision into reality. As highlighted in the ocean pathway, and has been mentioned by also Lord Goldsmith and my friend of Ace, the ocean plays a fundamental role to put us on a 1.5 pathway. It absorbs 25 to 30% of the anthropogenic CO2 emissions that would otherwise remain in the atmosphere and increase global warming. So counting on the ocean as a whole to continue to act as an increased carbon sink is thus not an option. 
In addition, ocean-based industries such as zero emission shipping, uh, offshore wind, and sustainable aquaculture and fisheries can and must greatly contribute to a net zero economy. The ocean and its industries have the potential to mitigate climate change on a huge scale, but this is currently done at great cost to ocean health, resulting in ocean warming, ocean acidification, and ocean deoxygenation. As high-level climate champions, our efforts are organized around two main campaigns. One of them, you just mentioned it, Elizabeth, the Race to Zero, but also Race to Resilience. Race to Zero is a global campaign to rally leadership and support from businesses, cities, regions, investors, universities, all for a zero carbon future. It is the largest ever alliance committed to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050 at the very latest. Therefore, to protect our ocean and deliver on the climate goals, we need to take two essential steps. One, of course, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and two, reverse ocean biodiversity loss. For companies to contribute to these global challenges, they need to join the race, join the race to zero as soon as possible and take actions to reverse the loss of blue carbon ecosystems and publicly report on the progress. First of all, by joining the Race to Zero, companies commit to drastically cut the greenhouse gas emissions by halving the emissions by 2030 and achieving net zero emissions as soon as possible and by 2050 at the very, very latest. As it was highlighted by Minister Goldsmith, climate action is ocean action. Greenhouse gas emissions reduction are vital to protect the ocean. For companies, joining this journey is demonstrating climate leadership to your employees, your investors, your customers, and driving change in your supply chain. Uh, this global engagement of non-state actors through the Race to Zero campaign is also absolutely critical to encourage governments to be ambitious and enhance their NDCs, demonstrating that the market are, in, are ready and solutions can be deployed at scale that is crucial. That's what you mentioned, Elizabeth, as, as the ambition loop. We need to work in an ambition loop that is uh, in which both government policies and private sector leadership reinforce each other and together take climate action to the next level. Secondly, while reducing their greenhouse gas emissions, companies should at the same time step up their actions to protect, restore, and sustainably use coastal and marine ecosystems. Biodiversity is critical to the implementation of climate crisis solutions as we still need to draw down the excess carbon in the atmosphere and the ocean. The best way of doing that is through nature. But as things are standing today, there isn't enough wild nature left to do the job, as Lord Goldsmith also mentioned. Therefore, reversing the loss of the blue carbon ecosystem, namely salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrasses, is a key part of global efforts to mitigate and adapt to climate change. These ecosystems sequester and store more carbon per unit area than uh, terrestrial forests, which make them significant net, net carbon sinks. So, however, if the ecosystem are degraded or damaged, their carbon sink capacity is lost and the carbon stored in the soil is released, resulting in CO2 emissions. So, in addition to the mitigation potential, marine natural ecosystems such as mangroves of coral reef can help safeguard coastal cities, communities, and businesses from a changing climate. Globally, near a billion people are estimated to be living in 100-year coastal floodplains by 2030. In this regard, the Race to Resilient, the sister initiative of the Race to Zero campaign, aims to catalyze a step change in global ambition and action for climate resilience, putting people and nature first. So this campaign is focused on helping frontline communities to build resilience and adapt to impacts of climate change, such as extreme heat, growth, flooding, and sea level rise. So today I'm calling all industries to take action to contribute to reversing blue carbon ecosystem loss by 2030 and publicly report on their progress. If we want ocean-based climate solutions to be at the forefront of the negotiations in Glasgow and be part of our future, governments need to see much more companies, investors and cities joining the race to zero and the race to resilience. Just like Oveis mentioned, I also believe COP25, the Blue Club, COP, has been a major milestone to strengthen the ocean climate agenda. We will surely hear more about it from Valdemar during the panel discussion. Now, 
we need to launch a global movement of ocean stakeholders to both commit to reduce their carbon emissions and take action to reverse marine ecosystem loss. Ocean initiatives, such as the Friends of Ocean Action, have a key role to play in this journey. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gonzalo, for sharing um, all of that with us and for your leadership and just tireless work on this agenda. Um, we're all grateful to you. Um, I'm sure everybody who has been listening has inspired to help push for the kind of ocean ambition loop you described and what a resounding signal it would send at Glasgow to have business, civil society, cities, regions, investors all coming together united in harnessing the ocean's potential to help meet the Paris goals as well as to create a more inclusive and resilient economy, which we know is top of mind for everyone. Well, we're delighted now to move into our panel discussion. Um, there will be a parallel opportunity as you listen to our panelists to um, have a dialogue, questions and answers um, using the Slido platform. If you want to do that, you go to either www sli.do, or you can scan the QR code that should be on the screen with your phone camera. And if you, when you reach Slido, just type in hashtag ocean dialogues and select this session so that you can access that. Well, while you're all doing that, um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished panelists. And I'll be brief about introducing them in the interest of time. They have extraordinary bios, um, but I'll just give their most current title. Um, Angelique Pupano, an international environment lawyer who is executive officer at the Seychelles Conservation and Climate Adaptation Trust, or SACAT. Sherry Nursalim, Special Advisor on Climate Change to the Government of the Republic of Indonesia and Vice Chairman of the Giti Group. Valdemar Kutz, Director of Environment and Oceans at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Chile. And David Obura, the founder of Coastal Oceans Research and Development in the Indian Ocean, or Cordio. A warm welcome to you all. Um, Valdemar, I'd like to start with you. Um, Chile is, of course, widely recognized uh, as a global ocean leader. Um, and I'd love it if you could give some background about why Chile sees the ocean as so integral in the response to climate change and just how you as a country have worked um, to incorporate ocean action into national policies, which we know is so critical. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I would like also to highlight the words uh, of uh, Lord Goldsmith, uh, because after listening to him, I believe we will have a second blue cup in Glasgow. Uh, uh, having said that, I wish to highlight that we're convinced that one of the most practical and cost-effective strategies for ocean protection is the creation of marine protected areas. Uh, they can contribute significantly to protect biodiversity, recovery of uh, species, uh, ecosystems, and degraded habitats. There is enough scientific evidence uh, to recognize the importance of MPAs in, in this regard, especially uh, recognizing its potential as uh, uh, in contributing to the health of the ocean so the ocean can function as a relevant climate regulator and carbon sink. Now, uh, as regards to my country, this is a narrative that we started in 2014 by uh, through the Our Ocean conferences uh, that uh, uh, Secretary Kerry uh, launched uh, that year. We organized the second uh, Our Ocean conference here in Chile. And through a state policy, uh, we have created a about 41 marine protected areas, accounting for 43% of our uh, exclusive economic zone, which, by the way, is about the 10th largest in the world. Uh, and we rank about sixth, sixth uh, globally uh, in total marine protected coverage by country. Now, research, as has been uh, highlighted, shows that ecosystems such as mangroves, seagrass meadows, salt marshes and are 10 times more effective at sequestering carbon dioxide annually on a per area basis than boreal uh, temperate or tropical forests. And this is uh, a point that I wanted to highlight because until now the UNFCCC has centered its uh, focus on, on forests, which is good, but we also have to center the attention of the UNFCCC uh, framework in, in what the oceans can do to tackle uh, uh, 
the, the, the climate change issue. Um, I also want to highlight that, well, we, we see a clear connection in the 30 by 30 target uh, uh, with the UNFCCC COP26 and also the CBD COP15 on biodiversity uh, and the ocean's uh, well-being. We expect that the high seas treaty under UNCLOS uh, process uh, will be concluded, destined to protect marine biodiversity beyond uh, national jurisdictions, will include strong provisions for the establishment of effectively managed and a connected system of ecologically representative marine protected areas in the high seas. Now, in this connection, President Piñera, during the Leader Summit on Climate, convened by President Biden, underlined that we should be more ambitious and invited the international community to go further and start what we call the second phase, which is our efforts to secure marine protected areas in the high seas. And this proposal is in line with President Biden's uh, final statement, as you may recall, in the sense that this decade is one of decisions, implementation, and collaboration. Uh, in fact, we wish to lead the way, as I said, to create a fully protected high seas MBA in our natural projection in the high seas. This is in the Nazca ridge of the southeastern Pacific as a priority measure to address the climate crisis. Uh, we are talking about a zone that is uh, recognized as ecologically and biologically significant area by the CBD. We're also making efforts in the Antarctica. And uh, uh, lastly, I wish to highlight our membership in the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, led by Norway and Palau, of which Chile is a member, in underscoring the role of ocean-based solutions to climate change. Uh, through significant evidence-based uh, recommendations in line with uh, SDG 14. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much for your question, Elizabeth. Well, thank you. And I wonder if I can ask a quick follow-up uh, about the COP um, in Glasgow in particular and, and pra practical and specific ways that we can really integrate the ocean's critical role into, uh, into the COP's work. So I wonder if you could say a bit about, about how we might think, do that, how we might think about it, and, and your hopes for or what kind of outcome we can anticipate uh, at the COP. Okay. Um, thank you for your question. Well, I, I believe that bringing uh, ocean issues into the center of the UNFCCC deliberations would create a greater impetus for countries to include ocean-related measures in their climate strategies, including in their NDCs, national adaptation plans, uh, adaptation uh, communications, and national, and national uh, policy framework. Uh, with ocean and uh, coastal ecosystems serving as the planet's largest carbon sink. Now, there are many opportunities for countries to upgrade uh, their NDCs, such as by protecting and restoring blue carbon ecosystems through climate smart uh, marine protected areas, uh, greening of shipping, decarbonizing fisheries, or uh, committing to offshore renewable energy. An outcome uh, of COP26, which we hope it's the second blue cup, should include clear uh, uh, encouragement to parties to cover ocean-based climate action in their climate strategies. Uh, the global stock take uh, taking place after COP26 as part of the second ambition cycle of the Paris Agreement could serve to identify ocean-related gaps and opportunities. And well, nature-based solutions are critical in building the resilience of ecosystems. And since financing for nature-based solutions remains comparatively low, we are called upon to urgently change the paradigm by accounting the value of blue natural assets, identifying investments, needs, and providing the necessary incentives, investment uh, mechanisms, and uh, finance. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, I want to bring Sherry in here. Um, and first, congratulations on your
your appointment as special advisor. Um, I know you are very focused on COP26, and uh, Indonesia's leadership will also be so critical in the context of your future G20. Um, but I wonder if you could lay out for us the importance of ocean and climate action for, from Indonesia's perspective and also from the perspective of your region more broadly. Thank you, Elizabeth, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, WAF, and dear friends of the oceans from wherever you are. Um, we are here today also because in Indonesia, the glaciers of the highest mountain of an island in the world, uh, Punchak Jaya, also the highest point in Oceania, standing at 4,800 over meters, are disappearing. We are also here because the largest archipelagic nation of 18,000 islands, also the longest shorelines in the world, can go around the world a few times. We've seen collapses in certain of the fishery stock. Actually, at my backdrop is, um, you say this is a seaside chat, and my backdrop is in Kurakura Bali. Kurakura is turtle, so it's Turtle Island. And so we we are off the coast of Bali. The, the sardine stock have collapsed, and the local uh, fishes and the communities are also suffering. So you know this is happening in many parts of the archipelago, and endangering local communities. Half of the protein source of the 270 million population in Indonesia are sourced from the oceans. We are here because Indonesia, the country with the most marine uh, biodiverse uh, uh, footprint, uh, and we have three quarter of the coral species of the oceans is threatened with human activities. The climate, the global warming, uh, the pollution, the plastics, and about 85% of the reefs uh, are at risk versus the global average of 60%. So tonight is also special here. Uh, it's a full moon in May and a celebration of the Buddhist Vaisak Day. It's the total lunar eclipse. And also this is the blood uh, super moon because it's the closest to the earth. So that could be a sign. And Indonesia, in the past two weeks, uh, we have uh, announced uh, our net zero target uh, 10 years um, ahead uh, of the original plan to 2060. And we have also, as a fossil producing nation, uh, taken the bold step to announce uh, no more coal-fired uh, power plants and also uh, uh, with energy transition uh, mechanism for early coal power, fire uh, power uh, retirement. So um, I think Indonesia could be a bar barometer of our human uh, harmony uh, with communities, with oceans, and also with the spiritual. We call it Trihita Karana in Balinese, our three ways to happiness. And we have uh, initiatives to work together with the region, uh, with ASEAN, as well as uh, with the islands, nations, uh, in different aspects that include um, engagement of the minds, of the hearts, as well as actions. And we have a very uh, outstanding uh, prototypes uh, or collaborations uh, that uh, I think we'll be pleased uh, to share. Thank you. Well, thank you. And um, let me follow up by asking if you can share a little bit more detail about the work that you're doing across the Pacific uh, or with ASEAN. I know it came up uh, in President Widodo's remarks at the U.S. Climate Leaders Summit as well last month, but can you share a little bit about some of the texture of that important work? Thank you. Yeah, so Indonesia is the chair of the archipelagic uh, island states and also aspires to be a global maritime fulcrum. Um, and we are now bridging uh, our good rapport with the Pacific. I think we are, I just talked to Ambassador Tanto Wiyaya, Indonesian ambassador in New Zealand. We are about to launch a, a Pacific Expo 
And uh, also, uh, we are actually uh, working together on uh, with indigenous communities, uh, communicating, with working on a systems approach uh, to uh, bridge the communities. I think we work with uh, partners from uh, around the world and we engage uh, youth, uh, the, uh, the indigenous communities, and we bring in actually uh, facilitators. And we use the, because of the COVID, and we have been using a lot of online approach uh, and including sensing journeys into the local communities, into the local projects with the fishers, with farmers. Uh, and, and I think we share, uh, it, sometimes at one session, uh, there could be uh, 1,000 uh, people participating. And we see this tri-sector approach of listening together and understanding, empathizing, uh, actually can see real outcomes and we uh, the kind of uh, uh, synergies that happen is uh, very encouraging. I think one of the initiatives that we feel um, I think we need in order to meet these targets we also need the financing apart from the you know the hearts and the uh, uh, that you know that these individuals and all these initiatives all need financing. And so we have been, uh, since the 2018 uh, World Bank IMF meetings in Bali, we have started this Trihita Karana platform uh, with partners, uh, International Chambers of Commerce, uh, UNSDSN, uh, World Bank, uh, IMF, uh, the OECD, of course, World Economic Forum has been a, a strategic partner with UID and, and many of us. And we, we have... Uh, uh, facilitated this uh, Trihita Karana roadmap on blended finance with the support. I think OECD has played a key role uh, together with WAF, and and we 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 have uh, created principles around blended finance. So the idea of blended finance is that we cannot meet the targets of the SDGs um, without private sector. So. Multilateral funding, government funding, philanthropic funding, can we can uh, find ways to use that catalytically to crowd in private sector investments. So we hosted, uh, I think in 2018, the largest blended finance event in the world, uh, mobilizing $10 billion. But I think we are looking at um, for the oceans uh, and also for the climate to do something uh, uh, quite significant. Uh, I think there is a two and two and a three, two to three trillion dollars uh, of global investment in the ocean economy across key areas, uh, conserving and restoring mangrove habitats, scaling up of um, wind production, decarbonization of international shipping, uh, increasing the production of sustainably sourced ocean-based uh, proteins, and we have this concept of the Blue Halo S, which is a better business, better world approach of managing the ocean's concessions that will actually feed into support, sustain the MPAs as well as the mangrove restorations, because sometimes we say that we know they are MPAs, but actually there's no funding to really protect them. So there have been really successful cases uh, like the um, in Georgia Ampad and others where, you know, our partners, Conservation International, Nature Conservation, others have been working on. And we really um, could see a revival and an and increase if we do this with approach of uh, blended finance. So at the G20, we look to launch uh, the global Global Blended Finance Institute. I think President Jokowi has written to President Joe Biden to invite them to support um, this initiative and co-founders and we'll be reaching out to um, other countries uh, to invite them to co-found this new multilateral. Uh, we are also um, looking to align the natural capital carbons and communities. Uh, so we, we, we believe that, you know, with Indonesia being, you know, with the forest, with the uh, peatland, with the uh, mangroves, with the oceans. Uh, I think we, we're probably the leading in the carbon stock and in natural capital aspects. So we, natural capital, carbon and communities, because we really see the 
uh, communities as the stewards of the of the earth. So we we really would like to invite uh, all the partners, and this this is a multilateral. So we're inviting countries to join us together and form this entity under the Blended Finance Institute, and to have this uh, natural capital carbon communities marketplace. Uh, so that we would be able to uh, continue to sustain uh, our oceans. And, and we, we also invite you to join us uh, in Bali. Thank you. Thank you. And those are such critical initiatives at a time when people are looking for really powerful new instruments for filling critical gaps. So thank you for that and for laying it out um, for us in such detail. Um, David, I'd like to turn to you next. First, let me, and on behalf of all of us, thank you for Kenya's um, patient co-hosting of the UN uh, Ocean Conference in Lisbon that we're all looking so forward to. Uh, so we've heard from Valdemar and Sherry about all the different ways that ocean action can be incorporated into a country's national policies and priorities, how it can be incorporated at the regional level. And we know how critical the ocean is to a sustainable global economy. It would rank as the world's seventh largest if one were counting it that way. Um, you work at the boundary of science and action, and Kenya has been such a leader in working to incorporate sustainable blue economy activities into its NDC. I wonder if you could say more about how, um, why that's such an important uh, set of steps for Kenya um, and, and for your region and, and continent more generally. Well, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. I'd also like to thank the Friends of Ocean Action in the West for, for this platform. It's an honor for me to be here with, with, with this panel and speakers. And, and thanks to Kenya Sherpa on the high level panel also for, for allowing me to present some of Kenya's experience uh, in this on the virtual dialogue and to the global community. Um, well, I think Sherry just led into this very well for a country in, in Kenya's context, but for any country really, ecosystems are really essential natural capital. Um, the IPBES, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, has told us you know, that nature provides us with 18 classes of benefits. Um, and these are really essential for uh, sustainable developments. They, they provide benefits across all of the SDGs. And to me, this is really synonymous with the sustainable blue economy and, and really the alignment between the SDG process uh, over the last five years and for the next decade and growth of interest in the blue economy really emphasizes uh, how important this is and how they align with each other. And climate mitigation and adaptation are just a subset of these benefits, albeit extremely important ones, of course. Now, Kenya provides just one case study of the importance of nature-based solutions uh, and the pivot towards them in Kenya's NDC is, I, quite, I think, quite instrumental. And this is with really a focus on mangroves and seagrasses because of their blue, blue carbon potential, of course, and their carbon sequestration, but also extending to associated ecosystems uh, in the longer terms, for example, coral reefs and also terrestrial vegetation, which is very important for mangrove and seagrass health. And then into further offshore into the EZs and in the and areas beyond national jurisdiction. I would say one note on nature-based solutions for climate change from the biodiversity community, which is where I come from, and also from rural uh, people that there is some discomfort with this concept, but I think that really comes from early mistakes in unnatural attempts at solutions. And really now that we understand so much better that nature-based solutions are really about ecosystem-based adaptation or ecosystem-based mitigation, and done right, they secure multiple benefit streams to all people, um, particularly those living close to the poverty line. They really provide very powerful pathways for countries to both address um, climate responsibilities and priorities as well as, as well as development strategies. So examples in Kenya's updated NDC uh, really revolve around blue carbon ecosystems for their value in carbon sequestration. And this is paired with their ability to bring finance into local communities. And I think this is critical. Um, this has been very amply demonstrated in Kenya's award-winning project, Mikoko Pamoja, um, and the interest that Kenya and other countries have in, in scaling up this, this model uh, to work in other locations. So in relation to mitigation, the payments for ecosystem services for coastal carbon uh, are a central part of the NDC. And they also mentioned now wetlands uh, 
and their role in greenhouse gas emissions and removals. Then in terms of adaptation, um, the, the role of uh, mangroves and seagrasses in protecting coastal communities and infrastructure, um, as well as um, you know, flood protection for informal settlements and, and vulnerable urban areas. Um, the mention of a mangrove management plan that, that supports this process into the future. And then uh, there is also mention of blue economy sectors, in particular ecotourism, seaweed farming, and very important is the resilience in fisheries. So in extending fisheries based on sustainable management and diversification of activities, um, and also developing insurance and other safety net schemes that help to mitigate against the uncertainties imposed by climate change. So my own take is that this really marks just a start and an even greater pivot of NDCs across many countries to solutions from nature and ocean ecosystems in coming cycles. And I think a final point I'll make on this um, is that the costs of coping with climate change are, of course, vast. Kenya estimates that $62 billion are required from now till 2030, of which 13% can be sourced locally. And I think it's important that natural capital or ecosystems provide essentially free services that would otherwise have to be paid for, and they provide a, a very important um, source of, of value and a source of, of solutions that otherwise would have to be invested in. So also investing in natural capital, investing in ecosystems, uh, as in the sustainable blue economy, uh, can generate very high returns. Uh, and there are multiple studies addressing this issue, both commissioned by the high-level panel recently, um, and I think and into the future. And so they are a priority for assuring ocean climate solutions and meeting the Paris Agreement. Now, a really important point about our being just at the beginning of a whole new way of, of investing in nature in, in all of these solutions. Uh, I wonder if we can ask you, I just want to follow up with you um, specifically about coral reef systems because of your expertise in that area and because it comes up so often as a source of such great vulnerability and risk. And I, I wonder if um, you can say a little bit about what do we most need to do um, with respect to the challenges um, uh, in those systems? Well, so the interesting question that is emerging now, um, and particularly with the biodiversity and climate crises, and coral reefs really are a flagship for this, is that they previously have been seen as separate crises, but as they are increasing, they're merging and becoming uh, intertwined with one another much more clearly. The threat level and impacts intensify one impacts the other even more, and these positive feedback loops uh, intensify each other. Uh, the inseparability of the two crises is now illustrated by a joint workshop report that is about to be launched by the IPCC and, and IPBES together, which I was able to participate in, uh, hopefully in the next few weeks. And it really demonstrates that increasing biodiversity loss accelerates climate change, uh, particularly uh, when the biodiversity loss is in globally important carbon sinks. And it's already clear that intensifying climate change accelerates biodiversity loss. Um, so importantly for us, thinking about ocean-based climate action, all nature-based solutions are undermined by both climate change and by biodiversity loss. So implementing them as early as possible is critical, but essential is twinning this with aggressive emission reductions, um, because otherwise all investments in nature-based solutions are undermined. Now, coral reefs really show us this. Uh, they're a flagship or learning ecosystem. We see them approaching the brink of collapse. Um, I think uh, Lord Goldsmith men mentioned the figure at the beginning, 99% of coral reefs may be lost at two degrees of warming. And it's important to realize that if they do collapse, um, and cease to be this globally connected ecosystem ringing the tropics, then not only uh, do local communities, economies, and countries lose this immense treasure, but there will be cascades of collapses and other systems that will follow shortly as well. So in a very real sense, with respect to climate change, if we save coral reefs, we save everything. And I love saying that from a coral reef perspective. The inseparability of the two issues increases with every year of inaction. So the action is critical. And I think um, a key thing that we must also think is, well, we need to have a message of hope to end with. And one is about embracing change, which is what climate change is about. It turns out in the ocean, the climate shifts, the temperature belts moving towards the poles is actually five times faster in the sea than on the land. 
And so this means that if we're planning ocean solutions, ocean climate solutions today, we have to think about how conditions may be in 10, 20, or 30 years and beyond. So we have to embrace this change. It's an, it's an uncomfortable question, but we must address it in order to make sure that the solutions that we're putting in place for decades from now I will have the greatest uh, possibility of, of working and providing the benefits uh, that, that we hope that they will. So thank you. Well, thank you. And you know, the founder of the UN Foundation, Ted Turner, had one mantra, which was to save everything. And I love that call for, in a sense, positive feedback loops to be harnessed in the right direction. It's the ones we want rather than the ones we want to avoid. So thank you for that. Um, Dave, uh, Angelique, I want to turn now um, to you. You uh, obviously rep come from another of the world's best, greatest ocean and climate leaders, the Seychelles. And I want to come back to this theme of ocean action at the national level, the NDCs. Um, we heard um, last, last month at the President Biden's climate summit uh, that the Seychelles would be dedicating an entire chapter of your NDC to ocean climate issues. And I'd love to hear you lay out from your perspective just how you've gone about doing that and, and how you work to prioritize this nexus between the ocean and climate. Uh, thank you very much and uh, greetings from, from the Seychelles. Thank you uh, for the invitation to, to come and speak on um, what is a very important issue uh, and uh, something that is very close to heart from a small island developing state. And it was uh, comforting um, and it was great to hear Lord Gold, Gold, Goldsmith, um, you know, the COP presidency highlighting um, the importance of voice of small island developing states. So indeed, I'm from the Seychelles, um, a small island developing state or uh, a big ocean state, as we like to, we like to say. Uh, we are 99% ocean and 1% land. And as a small island state, we often turn to the ocean for its potential as well as its, as its opportunity. But we know very well, the science is clear, that the ocean is critical in addressing the biggest threat to Seychelles, but also to humanity. That is, of course, climate change. Today, I share Seychelles' story as a beacon of hope um, and a hope that others will be inspired to do much of the same. Many people know Seychelles for its ambitious commitment uh, to protect 30% of its exclusive economic zone that it was able to deliver on in March of last year. Uh, today, I hope to share Seychelles' uh, blue carbon journey uh, but also, as you mentioned, a journey of including um, and really making, I think, our NDC a blue NDC. But it, this is not only a journey of, of ocean um, alone. It is a journey of partners, multidiscipline, all ocean stakeholders working towards nature-based solutions to address the threats to climate, of climate change. As mentioned, I am from the Seychelles Conservation and Climate Adaptation Trust. And with the use of the proceeds of the sovereign blue bond, um, Sherry earlier re referenced to the need for blended finance. And this is one such example where we have been able to get private sector, public sector, not for profit together to fund um, innovative uh, solutions, uh, solutions to um, challenges that we're facing at societal levels. But one of the projects that we're, that we're funding is to develop a, fa a first pass uh, assessment of potential blue carbon opportunities in Seychelles. Uh, the first milestone was a literature review uh, based on the tropical Western Indian Ocean. Uh, it became clear that there are major geographic gaps of blue carbon data sets, in particular in small island developing states. Uh, for example, in Seychelles, we have only four studies, uh, one on mangroves and three on seagrass meadows. So this has revealed a much needed gap that needs to be filled. So through SACAT's Coastal Wetlands and Climate Change Project, uh, we are embarking on a very ambitious, uh, groundbreaking piece of work, uh, multidisciplinary in nature in partnership with, of course, the government of Seychelles, uh, the Pew Charitable Trust, the Nature Conservancy, University of Oxford, University of Seychelles' Blue Economy Research Institute, and local NGOs. So really bringing together scientists, financiers, non-for-profits, academic institutions, and really bridging um, that science policy nexus. 
So with that, we intend to map seagrass meadows um, across the entire exclusive economic zone of Seychelles, um, assess carbon cores of those um, meadows um, in specific locations. Uh, we will then integrate uh, we will then integrate this into our nationally determined contribution and um, in particular subsequent uh, climate communications. We are doing this very much as an ecosystem based adaptation because of seagrass meadows triple benefits. So biodiversity, of course, which we're very much dependent on um, for tourism. Uh, to attract those charismatic uh, turtles um, uh, in, the, in, in our marine spaces, which of course many people uh, come to visit our countries to see. Uh, nurseries for fisheries that supports um, local communities and their livelihoods. And of course, that global ecosystem service um, to the world uh, in tackling climate. So the commitments, you did reference those uh, that um, our Minister for Environment uh, made at the lead up event to President Biden's climate summit. And that is to put protections in place through our marine spatial planning process and the marine protected area network to protect at least 50% of seagrass and mangroves by 2025 and protect 100% by 2030 should external funding be available. So as I said, really our revised NDC is a blue NDC, one where we were able to look at not only blue carbon as a nature-based solution, but also various sectors within the blue economy that's going to assist us to build resilience and adapt to the impacts of climate change. And internationally, we continue to work with our partners, the COP presidency, to continue to push to have a closer nexus between ocean and climate within the UNFCCC process. And most recently, of course, look to see how we can include ocean within the global stock take. So uh, with that, uh, very exciting journey ahead to, to Glasgow and I'm hopeful that Seychelles can really um, continue to, to showcase the work that we've done and inspire others to join our leadership. Take myself off mute, first of all. <laughs> um, that was terrific. And I'd like to pick up on this theme of partnerships that you've all spoken about in very powerful and concrete ways, and especially this point about financing that you just raised. Um, and I, if we can hear more about Seychelles efforts to finance your ocean assets and the work that SACAT in particular is doing around those topics um, would be really helpful to hear. Um, absolutely. Uh, and yes, indeed, that's uh, sort of SACAT's uh, niche and baby. So um, SACAT itself was created through a public-private partnership uh, with the government of Seychelles and the Nature Conservancy to facilitate a debt for nature swap. Um, and what that means in simple terms is really a, a transaction to restructure government's debt on the basis that they make a commitment to protect 30% of the ex exclusive economic zone. So um, the debt for nature swap not only um, allows for these financial benefits in terms of the, um, the benefits, uh, the, the debt relief for government, um, but also it means that every year we have uh, and I will go on to explain how this increases, but for from the debt for nature swap, 200,000 US dollars that goes towards supporting ocean conservation and climate adaptation projects. Um, and this is on an annual basis for the next 20 years with an endowment that is being invested in ESG uh, to provide further long-term um, financing for our ocean assets. Um, of course, this brought you know, the Nature Conservancy, the government of Seychelles um, together, but it was just the beginning. Uh, we then went on to have the government of Seychelles issue a sovereign blue bond and hear a really uh, evidence of partnership with having private investors um, from the United States invest in a sovereign issued bond um, by the government of Seychelles, but bringing down the interest costs with... Um, multilateral organizations providing um, those risk reducing mechanisms like a uh, partial guarantee by the World Bank. Um, and here with the, with the blue bond, it, it offers, it enables SACAT to be able to offer annually 700,000 US dollars as grants 
to local communities, uh, to businesses, to individuals, to be able to be part of um, our transition to a low carbon um, ocean, uh, ocean based economy. And uh, in addition to that, the, so the Sovereign Blue Bond also uh, provides uh, local businesses with the opportunity to invest, you know, really be part of, of these solutions by having a 12 million US dollar um, fund, a blue investment fund, where they're able to um, take loans from the Development Bank of Seychelles. Uh, these are two um, ongoing mechanisms, but SACAT continues to work on new, um, uh, innovative, uh, exciting mechanisms. And currently we're exploring blue carbon financing. We know it's been, um, it's been, it's, it's, it's quite a way when it comes to mangroves, but of course there's so much more work when it comes to seagrass um, to explore what blue carbon financing could emerge from there. Um, and that's something that SACAT is very much exploring. And I'm definitely going to be reaching out to Sherry to learn more about this uh, um, blended financing Finance uh, Institute in, in, in Indonesia. Happy to, you know, contribute our experiences there. Love to. Well, thank you so much, um, and thank you all for an incredible conversation. I, I fear that our time is at an end for today. Um, there is so much to talk about. Um, we could use so much more time with you all. I hope there will be many opportunities to come together again. But I just want to thank you all for a truly inspiring and truly hopeful conversation. I mean, these challenges are immense. But what we've heard from all of you is the incredible power in solutions we already have, steps that are already being taken. And if the right connections are made, the right financing is there, and the right coalitions of support are built, there really is a powerful opportunity to move much uh, faster and further ahead. Uh, I think we've heard several key messages really loud and clear. Um, one, that we are living on a blue planet, <laughs> that ocean action is integral and critical to climate action, just as climate action is urgently needed for the oceans, that nature is clearly a central part of the solution with the ocean being vital to both mitigation and adaptation, and that the impacts of these crises, whether it's climate and ocean or climate and biodiversity loss, have to be tackled together because they are integral systems and they are uh, integral, therefore, in their solutions. So as we move through this year's critical negotiations and milestone moments, move toward the COP in Glasgow, move toward the Ocean Conference in Lisbon next year, I think we have a really strong roadmap for ways to make sure that the ocean is integral, not only to those discussions, but to all the actions and investments that are required required. So it's a busy road ahead, but a lot of opportunity. And I just want to thank you all again for your leadership uh, in all domains, for our uh, colleagues who joined us earlier in this session, and to the participants who joined online and have been having a good exchange and Q&A throughout. So thank you all again. Um, I'd invite you all to reconnect to TopLink and share continuing thoughts and views, and also encourage you to join tomorrow's dialogue session on climate breakthroughs, the road to COP26 and beyond in 2021. So this will focus on some of the harder to abate sectors and the breakthroughs we need to achieve a net zero world. So to everybody, warm thanks again. Stay safe. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your day and have a lovely evening.